Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing over here? And here? And here? Well, that was, that was rough. That was like a tie, three-way tie between all of you guys. Hey, if you're new this morning, I want to introduce myself. My name is John. This is my wife, Amy, here on the front row. And together, uh, we get to lead this campus of CT Church. There's actually four of those all over the Houston area. And so we're pumped that you guys joined us today at this one. If you're a guest, we just want to welcome you. Also wanted to let you know we're doing something a little different in the service. But before I get to that, is anybody, uh, have you ever driven home and taken like canned biscuits or croissants or something from the store and you get home and one of them is burst open or you try to open it and it pops open and some of the dough po- pops out? Has anybody ever seen that happen? Anybody feel like that when you put your pants on this morning? That's what happened to me. I'm like, wow, this is bad. It's like instead of the weight loss club, I, the biggest the show, The Biggest Loser, I want to wait until they do The Biggest Gainer, and I'm going to audition for that one. I'm going to go on there. But uh, I want to let you know if you're a guest with us today, you may already know or realize this, but everything in this service except this piece right here and something at the end is completely being brought to you by our young adults and our youth leaders from the top to the bottom. Uh, they're doing, they have done the worship, they have ushered, they've been our prayer partners, they're in the media booth, they've done everything uh, inside these four walls today. They're going to be bringing you the messages also. And uh, a few months ago, we transitioned how we were leading our youth ministry, and we started working with our young adults to help them uh, grow into some roles of ministry. And since we have done that, our youth ministry has grown to the largest size that it's been since I've been here as pastor. And uh, it's completely done by volunteers, and and it's this group of people that you're going to hear from today, and they're doing a phenomenal job of just growing. And so we started, uh, a few months ago, we started something where we were pouring into their lives, leadership, uh, education, and mentoring, and all those things, and they have grown rapidly and exponentially, and we wanted you to be able to hear from them uh, during this service uh, today. So uh, one of the things that we noticed all through history is this is that the major moves of God, almost all of them, were led by the younger generation. Whether it's for their dissatisfaction with the status quo or whatever, there is something that happens in the young generation that they say something needs to change. And the spiritual awakenings, the great revivals of history, have been led by this this young generation of people. And we believe that God is getting ready to do something massive in 2019 in this campus. And so we're planting them today as a seed of what God is going to begin to do in you, through you, and all around this place. We don't need revival anymore. We need revolution. We need God to do something absolutely astounding and incredible, and He's going to do this. So we've labeled this group of people Catalyst. We call them Catalyst because a catalyst is an agent that you can add to another chemical substance, and it does not lose its properties, but it causes a reaction in the things around it and precipitates change. And that's what they are doing. And so here's what I want you to do for me today. If you would, unless you're using your phone to post something on social media that they are saying, which I'm okay with, if you want to post something, tweet something, whatever, that they're saying during the message, feel free to do that. But other than that, if you would put your phones away, If you wouldn't talk to the person next to you and you would lean in and listen to what they have to say, I guarantee you we listened to three messages in the first service and God challenged us significantly. And so you're going to get something out of today that is absolutely going to bless you. So lean in and when they say something that's good or something semi-good even, just say, yeah, that's what's up or amen or something. Just yell at them or something so that they'll know that you're loving what they're saying. Cheer them on. Lean in and hear what God is going to say today. So as they come, would you just give it up for our Catalyst group, and the first one up is Macy. Wow. I feel like I'm on Ellen right now. Hey, everyone. I don't really look like that in person. That was my, my bridal portrait. It's like real good. Wow. I am really nervous, so bear with me, okay? This is not easy to do. But I have to admit something to y'all before we even get started. I walked into this room, and I was like, ooh, I'm feeling some judgment already. People see my cheetah boots, my cheetah belt, and my cheetah Apple Watch band, and they're like, wow, she was probably a cheetah girl. And that's not the truth, okay? I'm a little mad that I was not asked to be on Disney Channel when I was eight years old. But it's fine. Don't judge me, okay? Don't judge my cheetah print. It's cute. How many of you can honestly say that you have walked into this room this morning and you've already judged somebody else? Don't lie. Don't lie. All y'all are liars. 
You have walked into this room and you have either judged them in a good way and like, dang, I like her outfit or man, that girl really needs to brush her hair. Like, don't lie. Have any of you done that this morning? I'm not moving on until at least four or five people raise their hands. Thank you. All of you are going to heaven. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of times I've noticed in my own life, I judge people based off of a few of these categories. Skin color, how they wear their hair, or if it's blue or purple, because, you know, that kind of stands out a little bit. How they dress, whether or not they got a Michael Kors purse or not, or like the Louis Vuitton purse, what kind of shoes they're wearing. Don't lie. You do it too. Whether or not people have tattoos and piercings. Mm. That's one of the way I look. I look at people and I'm like, you got a tattoo? Same. <laughs> yeah, we judge people, but a lot of times it's not positive. A lot of times we judge people and it's so negative and it's so not good for us. So what can we do? A lot of times we judge people and we focus on only the negative things about them. And it's really a bad habit that we need to break. I know for me, a lot of times when I'm judging people, it's not nice. I judge what they're wearing. I judge the color of their hair because I can't pull off purple hair like some people can. But a lot of times we don't just judge people off their appearance. We judge people off based off the conversations we've had with them. If the first time you ever spoke to somebody, they told you about their political standpoint, would you talk to them again? <laughs> Probably not. I wouldn't. I'd be like, I don't have time for that. Like, nope. Or if the first time you ever talked to somebody, they like insulted your cheetah boots. You wouldn't talk to them again. I wouldn't. If you insult my cheetah boots, we ain't friends. <laughs> and it's hard, but a lot of times we do. We focus on all the negative things instead of seeing the positive. It's just human nature. It's, it's us living in our flesh. But that one person that really gets on your nerves because of the clothes they wear or how they spoke to you the first time you met is most likely the person that God wants you to go after. Those people that we judge so harshly are the people that God wants us to chase after and have relationship with. Maybe not to save them and to get them into the kingdom of heaven, but maybe just to grow ourselves. A lot of times God wants to teach us how to give mercy and grace to those around us when we don't really like the way they look or the way they dress. One thing, I had a dream the other night, y'all. Jesus speaks to you in dreams. I believe it and because it happened. But he told me in this dream, there's a person that you don't like and you struggle in a relationship with them, and every time you see them, you're like, why? Everybody has one. Don't lie. And he said, pick one thing about that person that you like. And I was like, well, that's going to be kind of hard. But I found one thing. They're always kind to other people. And that's kind of hard to cling to. Like, uh, not everybody's always nice all the time, let's be real. But that person is always nice to people and is always loving on them. And I'm like, dang, that's pretty cool. So cling to that one thing that you like about that person. There can be 50 things that you hate about them, but if there's one thing that you like about him, it can counteract those 50 things. God gives us grace when we need it. But a lot of times we just need to work on ourselves. There, there can be 50 things wrong with that person, but there's 51 things wrong with us. So just saying, stop worrying about being offended by how people look or how they speak. And instead, ask God to give you the heart to love them the way he does. In Luke 19, Jesus hung out with a tax collector, okay? Two things about tax collectors at this time is, one, they were hated by the Jews as a representation of the government that was trying to, like, destroy them. And second, tax collectors were often known for taking more money than a person owed and pocketing it for their own self-gain, okay? These people are not good people. But Jesus saw Zacchaeus, and he said, hey, dude, let's hang out. Like, what? A lot of people were looking at Jesus like, what is he doing? Why is he hanging out with this unworthy person? In another situation, Jesus hung out with a woman at the well, and she had five husbands, and one she was currently with that was not her own. So she was a little scandalous, right? We can agree. She was a little scandalous, a little sketchy. Jesus knew this, but he still talked to her. And then Peter, Peter was a fisherman, okay? And two more things about fishermen is they were seen as uneducated a lot of times, and then they had potty mouths because they were sailors, that was a joke. Fishermen, potty mouths, ha. Fishermen, sailors, come on, okay. I thought it was funny. But Jesus hung out with all of these people. He had relationship with all these people despite his first assumption of them. We assume that Zacchaeus is a thief, 
But when Jesus had a relationship with him, he, he gave back everything that he ever took from anybody and gave them four times more than that. So he was actually a giver. The woman at the well, we think she's a little scandalous, but she went back to her village and told everybody about God. She was really an evangelist. And Peter, who we think is an uneducated potty mouth fisherman, became one of Jesus' disciples. So if those three things aren't proof enough that our assumptions are normally wrong, I don't know how to help you. Okay? So what can we do? We need to start giving people the benefit, the benefit of the doubt. When we see something wrong with them, we have to stop and say, nope, that's not who they are. They're more than that. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, it will be, wait, yeah, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So I have to ask myself this a lot. And I'm no perfect person. And the reason I'm preaching this is because the Lord is teaching it to me right now. But the question I ask myself is, would I want someone to judge me the way that I judge them? It's, it's a tough pill to swallow. We, a lot of times, judge people so harshly and don't even think about how it would make us feel. I hate that saying, like, treat others the way you want to be treated. But it's so true. If we want to be loved, we have to give love. So we can choose, peop- choose to see people the way Jesus does. We can choose to see them beyond their skin tone, beyond their appearance or how they talk to you or whether or not they have purple or blue hair. We just need to love everybody. When we choose to see people past their flaws, God changes our hearts to everybody around us, not just that one person. When we go to that one person that we want nothing to do with, he changes our hearts for even the people who annoy us just a teeny tiny bit. They they stop annoying us. We stop hating them or we stop judging them and we see them the way God does as his creation, as his sons and daughters who are holy and deserving to be loved. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be, a, be willing to associate with the people of low position. Do not be conceited. A lot of times when we judge people, we judge them because we think we're better and they're, they're not worthy or they're not as cool as us or as pretty as us or whatever it may be. But God commands us to be associated with the people that we see in low position. And we need to stop hyping ourselves up and saying we're too good for you and go after those people. In the first 30 seconds within meeting somebody, you decide, are they in my in-group or are they in my out-group? If they don't look like you, they don't wear the same clothes as you, they don't have the same socioeconomic background, they were raised differently, or they have a different skin color than you, you put them in your out-group a lot of times. And then if they look like you and they have all those things in common with you, you put them in your in-group. But those people in your in-group aren't the people that God wants you to chase. He wants you to go after those people that nobody wants to be around and that nobody wants to have relationship with. So this church, we have a saying, and it's anyone from anywhere who's done anything can come here to find hope, help, and healing. But are we really living that? I know a lot of times I have to check my own heart and make sure that I'm letting anyone from anywhere who's done anything. Guys, there's people in this church who have um, drug-addicted pasts and alcoholism, and they've been divorced, or maybe they've had an abortion and all those things that we look down on, but they're the best leaders because they're the ones who needed God the most, and he met them where they were. So we need to choose to meet them where they are. I just want to leave today with one question. If Jesus pursued the people that nobody wanted to be around, why shouldn't we? Thank you. What is up? Y'all are lively. That was so good, man. I'm so excited to be up here. Macy killed it, so hopefully I will too. She's kind of hard to follow, but all right, let's just get right into it. So I'm guessing with as long as the internet's been around, we've all seen videos and pictures and my all-time favorite, I love memes. They're just, you can't bypass like a good meme of how life has ways of making us have trust issues. So for an example, you guys have heard the monster under your bed scary story, right? Like, I grew up with that, and still, some days, like, when I'm in the dark and I get nervous, I do the whole, like, run and jump thing from your bedroom door to the bed. Like, I'm 22. I'm still doing this. Probably will continue to do it 
my whole life. My dog, Onyx, he likes to like crawl under the bed and hide. And one time I was standing, like unmaking my bed, because I make my de- bed every day. You should too. Um, <laughs> I was standing unmaking it, and all of a sudden he's under there and he just like swipes at my foot. <laughs> no. No. So, I will continue to run and jump. Judge me all you want, but don't because Macy just preached on that. Okay. (laughs) So, anything from that, because I have trust issues there, to one of my all-time favorites was the trust fall. Y'all know what a trust fall is, right? Okay, well, I have my fair share experience with this one. Because, you see, high school is deemed by the media, by magazines, TV shows, movies, to be some of your best years of your life, right? Well, for me, it was my not so best years because around that time, that's when this trust fall became real, real popular. So there was this one day I was walking into class and um, it just so happened to be a class full of like a bunch of my friends. And I was going to sit down to trust the chair to catch me because it always did every time I trusted it to catch me when I sit down. And one of my friends thought it would be hilarious to pull it out from underneath me right at the last second when I'm not paying attention and all too quickly found myself laying flat on my back, staring up at the ceiling and the whole classroom laughing at me. Needless to say, needless to say, I never looked at any of them the same way again. Nope, it was like I'm walking into the class the next day, I'm like, I I see you. Don't do that again. So, So I feel like we've all somewhat had an encounter with something that's caused us to have trust issues with someone, correct? Whether that be like a prank that was done on you that went wrong and then you got embarrassed, or like me, or something maybe a little bit serious, like you find out one of your friends is gossiping about you, which isn't fun, or, you know, a loved one broke a promise that they meant to keep, but then they didn't, or maybe something like a little bit more personal and deep, like betrayal by someone you love. So we know that God doesn't intend for us to do life alone. Like, that's why we have life groups here. We want to be in relationship with one another. But in order to have that, we have to have some sort of level of trust, right? So God tells us in his word of how we are to live in relationship with one another and that it doesn't have to have broken trust. We don't have to have all of this pain. And it's in 1 Corinthians 13, he tells us to live in relationship with each other in love. So it says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So it's easy for us to read this scripture and want others to love us like, a, like that. We want others to go and fix what's been broken in our hearts and been broken in our trust and in our relationships. But as much as we want others to love us like this, I think we shouldn't get lost in the fact and thinking that we're the only ones who've experienced some kind of pain in our relationship. So you've heard the saying, hurt people, hurt people, right? It's real popular. Well, if the saying proves true, then that means that if you've been hurt by someone, it's very likely that you've turned right around from that hurt and hurt someone else right after that from the hurt. It's normal. It's not, it's not an abnormal thing. It's what happens in our flesh because the hurt is deep. And as people who follow Christ, the example of what love truly is, we're called to live above that. Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this is the same kind of love that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 13, the patient kind, the selfless kind, the kind that we want everyone to love us like. And as much as God has called others to love us like that, he has called us to love others like that. I know I don't always do that. Why? Well, because when I find out someone has been gossiping about me or when someone breaks a promise or something, someone says something that hurts, my natural instinct in my emotions and in my flesh is to turn right around and act out of that and find someone and say, hey, can you believe what she just said about me? Why'd she say that? What did I ever do to her? What am I doing? Gossiping. Doing the same exact thing. And it's not easy to deny that. It's not easy to not do that. It is, but it is necessary to choose the kind of love that says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to repeat that hurt. Jesus in that scripture talks about how we live as an example to others. Whether we live according to God's word or our flesh or our emotions, someone is watching. So who are we representing by the choices we make either in that love 
or out of that love. Listen, we don't live in a perfect world. Hurt and pain and suffering, broken trust, anything negative, you name it, is all too common. People walk away from relationship with one another permanently because conflict is too deep and the hurts are too deep and it just can't be resolved. But Jesus is giving us another way, a way to live without broken trust, a way to live in harmony with one another. This world has known enough loss and pain and hurt from humans. We do this to each other. And we're perfectly capable of making the choice to stop it if we wanted today. We don't have to live in the suffering. It can end with us. But it's a choice that we make to take on the love that looks like dying to ourselves and our pride and our ego and our selfish gain so that someone else can feel valued when all they've known is rejection. It's a choice that we make to say, I don't really like this person. I don't really like how they dress. I don't really like how they talk or their political standpoint or whatever you may say. But I'm going to value them and I'm going to uplift them and honor them instead of tearing them down. Or it's a choice to say, look, this person's dirt may be really good, but I'm going to choose not to talk about them behind their back. I'm going to choose to find one good thing to say to someone else about them. That is what love is. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 means. That is what restores broken trust in men's broken hearts. The pain that you've endured in your relationships, the hurt that you've encountered in your life, can end with you. And that is what God has called us to do as his children. Love with everything we have and in every way that we can. Not for our own selfish gain, but for the sake of helping others find hope, help, and healing. That's what we're all about. Listen, imagine a world without bullying in, in the schools where your children go. Imagine a life without ever being bullied. I was bullied as a kid. But imagine that that never happened because they chose that love. Imagine a world without gossip and fallen out friendships because of the betrayal. Or better yet, imagine a world without broken families from divorce and children who have parents together, and love that lasts forever and is unconditional. What you want, you can have when you give it. And when we can do that, all of this can be accomplished when we choose this love. And when we choose this kind of love, there is nothing that will stop the church from fully establishing God's kingdom here on this earth. Nothing. Thank you. Come on, yo! What's going on? Thank yeah, Aaron! Thank you. Awesome. Let's hear it for Macy and Sicily. Come on, they killed it, y'all. But they saved the best for last. Let's go. Wow, oh, I feel some shots. Good. It really is, like, terrifying to kind of be up here. You almost kind of, like, want to freeze up. And this actually happened to me before not too long ago. Yeah, I got the mic to my chin now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. This actually happened to me uh, not too long ago. See, I was at one of my youth guys' – yeah, I call them my youth guys', by the way. I was at one of my youth guys' birthday parties, and uh, it, it wasn't even at his house exactly. It was at his uncle's house. And I, I've never met his uncle before. So this is a completely stranger guy. Keep him in mind, we're still in Texas. You know, guns are a thing. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. So we're having his birthday party, and somewhere along the line, I think it's a good idea. Hey, let's just start wrestling, right? No, <laughs> this ends very badly. Because we end up putting a hole in the dude's wall. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, what? Oh, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> keep in mind this is a brand new house and we just put a hole in the dude's wall I was completely terrified at this point as I should be because remember 
guns in Texas, still a thing. <clears throat> Have y'all ever been in a situation like this where you're just completely paralyzed by your own fear? Where like a boss comes up to you and he says, hmm, what you doing? And you say, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> See, this isn't, it just doesn't happen to us too. See, it actually happens to David. If you look at Psalms 143, verse 3 and 4, it says, My enemy has chased me. He has knocked me to the ground and forced me to live in darkness like those in the grave. I am losing all hope. I am paralyzed with fear. <laughs> so, I really like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really like that last part when it says, I am paralyzed by fear. Because I never really thought of it as fear, like as a paralyzer. So, this really opened my mind. See, what a paralyzer is, is it stops you whenever you want to move. Or better yet, it stops you whenever God is telling you to move. See, this is exactly what happens to us when we feel like we want to share the gospel to other people, but we don't, because what do we think? Oh, man, he's, he's not going to want to hear us. They're, we're going to be judged by them. <clears throat> See, the, and the, I mean, I'm no exception to this. This actually happened to me before, not too, or quite a while ago. See, back when I was in youth, we had a food fight. It was planned. <laughs> that joke didn't go too well, got it. See, we had a food fight. It was a planned event. Uh, it was a part of an outreach. So we were trying to reach a bunch of our, bunch of our community. And I thought, man, it would be a great idea to bring one of my best friends named Sammy. See, the cool thing about Sammy was is that he didn't exactly know Jesus, but he wasn't, he wasn't against him either. It, it, he just didn't know. He just wasn't informed. And so, you know, a big thing about outreaches is that we always try to the main goal is to make sure that they know Jesus first, and then we get to have fun. So we decided to, that wasn't a joke. So we, decided, <laughs> so we decided to have an altar call and worship before the food fight. And at the moment, we were, you know, we were doing our typical church thing, you know, I, I, head down, eyes closed, come to the altar if you want Jesus, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> And somewhere along the way, you know, I saw that Sammy wasn't moving, so I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should say something. You know, maybe I should tell him, like, dude, I got your back. Like, I'm right here for you. You know, if you want to go up there, you know, I'll support you. This could be the best decision of your life. You know what I did? not But I didn't do that. You know why? Because I was so scared that, man, he's going to look at me different. He's going to, I'm going to just forever be the Christian guy who just always wants to talk about Jesus and nothing else, and he's going to write me off of that. So I decided to sit in my own fear and just do nothing about it. And pretty soon the moment passed. You know, we had our food fight. It was, it was a fun night. And then I'll never forget on the car ride home, he tells me, you know what? You know, I should have done it. You know, I should have gone up there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine that? that was running through me. See, because, of, because I decided to sit in my fear, Sammy wasn't saved that night. And this is exactly what the enemy wants from us. He wants to stop us in our tracks. He wants us to sit still in our fear because whenever we sit still in our fear, people don't get saved. And the harsh reality that we have to come to face, the pill that we don't want to swallow, is that when people don't get saved, they end up in hell. Mm-hmm. How many of people have ever felt like this before? Yeah? See, this is not a very good spot to stay in. Because if you look at Ezekiel 3:17 through 18, it says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman over the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them a warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. Come on, y'all. Let's focus on that last part. That's the one that we don't want to listen to, right? I will hold you accountable for their blood. Can you imagine that? Because of that night, Sammy's blood could have been on my hands. If we would have gotten a wreck and died, that would have been my fault. See, 
we, we got to understand that as Christians, this is our responsibility once we've been saved. We have to reach the lost. We have to go after the ones, y'all. We have to not be afraid. We have to move even though we are afraid of what might happen. See, we walk through life with all sorts of things in our head like, what was he going to think of me? What's going to happen? Uh, I don't know. But the thing is, we got to remember that what they think of us isn't as important as their salvation. See, or maybe you're, maybe you're one of the people that think you're not qualified. Man, somebody's better for another job, right? For this job, right? Somebody else is surely better. No, because you are the qualification. You are the one that has been called to these people, y'all. Y'all, can I be real for a sec? We're sitting here afraid in our own fear when it even says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-discipline, y'all. Come on. Last time I checked, y'all, we can, we're over here. We, we think it's okay to be afraid. First thing is, we don't, we don't fight our fear. We have a God that fights our fear for us. Come on, we don't have to do a thing. Last time I checked, my God isn't the God who bows to fear. My God isn't the God who just, who, oh, I'm so pumped right now. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but y'all, we can't sit in our fear. It's so important that we reach the lost, y'all. Y'all, I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to stop being afraid. I'm ready to stop being afraid of my friends and what they may think. Because I know plenty of my friends who aren't going to heaven. And that needs to change. I think we, we all need to start fighting back for the ones that we love the most. Thank y'all so much. Hey, what is up? How you guys doing? That's good, thanks. Man, Jared, I once heard a really good pastor or preacher say that I'm just the peppermint after the flame and yawn. No, okay, yeah, so it's awesome. I'm really thankful I get to do this. Um, uh, so the topic of my conversation today is, is vulnerability dangerous? So let me ask you guys this. How many of you have ever been in the shower, you're finishing up, and you reach your hand out, you reach your hand out of the shower, and there's no towel? <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you, you get out of the shower. I mean, you're still safe. You get out of the shower, you go to the closet. But what do you do if there's no towels in the closet? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You do one of two things or you do them both. First, you call for someone to bring you a towel. But what do you do if there is no one responding to that call? I mean, you'll sit there for a good, you know, five minutes trying to get someone to call or to answer you. Well, you got to open the door and pray that no one sees you. <laughs> and honestly, in my mind, it's, there's always this, like, this, this music that goes on, bum, 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 bum. I'm looking left to right, trying to make it to my room without anyone seeing me. So let me ask you this. How many of you guys have actually gotten caught doing this? <laughs> Thankfully, I have not. Thank Thank God. And to all the people that have been on the other side of this, we're praying for you. <laughs> so now check this out. So we've all experienced situations in life where we find ourselves running away from vulnerability because of a fear of being hurt. Or maybe a fear of what people may say or, you know, what they may think of you or what they may say about you. But what if we started seeing vulnerability in a new way? What if we stopped running away from it and we started to embrace it? 
So many times we scare ourselves out of being vulnerable, and we say things like, man, I can't open up in that friendship, or I can't open up in that relationship, because the last time I did it, I got hurt. And so we end up, we end up saying these things like, man, I, I just can't do that, so I'm, I don't want to get hurt. But I want you guys to see today that vulnerability is what makes us authentic. It makes us worthy of being trusted. But here's the thing. It also requires us to trust easy without the fear of being hurt. So you may ask me, Manoa, well, how do I do that? How do, how do I trust easy without the fear of being hurt? And I know we're always so scared of this idea. You know, we're always so scared of the idea of being vulnerable or opening up. Um, and look, I'm not saying go around trusting anyone. But what I am saying is that you should trust somebody. There should be somebody in your life that you can say, man, I messed up. I made a mistake. Can you help me? Um, so, so, but you, we have to ask ourselves, do we really trust anyone, though? Or is, or is that defense mechanism that I've so often placed within my mind ready to jump out at the slightest moment of something possibly going wrong? So, but here's, here's what God says. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. You see, through, through our vulnerability, the thing we're always so scared of, God is strong. And his strength becomes our own. So here's the thing, friends, family. We don't have to be afraid to open up. Because God is strong when we're weak. When we're vulnerable and we're, you know, at our weakest or we're, we're saying the thing that we don't want anyone to know or the thing that hurt us the most, God is strong and we can trust in him. But I want to give you guys an example of this. So as most of you know, or maybe, maybe you don't, but uh, when I'm not here, I'm, I'm at work. And the job that I work, up, work at is a roofing company. And we work in the chemical plants. So my job requires a lot of heights. So I'm in very high places all the time. So what do you think my most vulnerable, what do you think I'm most vulnerable to when I'm high up in the air? Falling. So this is a lot of times what our relationships look like, or our friendships look like. Man, I'm right on the edge of this. I'm right, I'm about to step. If I, if I step, if I step and I tell that person something, I'm going to fall and I'm going to hit the ground and it's going to hurt because that person's going to take what I said. He's going to run off and tell so and such. Then you have gossip and all that junk. And so instead, what I'm going to do is because this is obviously not safe. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stand as far away from the edge as possible. And I'm not going to open up. So, but luckily, a genius man invented this. So as most of you know, this is a hard hat. And this is a harness. This is what we use on the job site. But the thing I want to show you guys today is one special device that someone invented to keep you from falling. This is what we call a yo-yo. It's like a seat belt. So if I were to step off the edge, normally we attach this thing to our backs. Oh, you have to attach this to your back. Um, but no, you attach this to your back, and if you were to fall off the, uh, the roof, this locks like a seatbelt. So it prevents you from going off and hitting the ground. <laughs> so look, this is how it is when we have God on our side. 
We don't have to be afraid of falling. I don't have to be afraid. So I can freely go to the edge. I can freely express myself. I can freely open up and tell that person that secret. Tell that person that failure. Tell that person because I know that no matter what, I have a lifeline that has my back, that it's going to it's going to attach me to this end and I'm not going to fall off. I'm not going to hit the ground and I'm going to be okay. That's what it looks like to be vulnerable when you have God on your side. Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians, so now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so the power of Christ can work through me. So not only are we not only are we safe, we're now strong. We, we have no fear. We have confidence. We have confidence in our vulnerability. So guys, before I leave today, I just want to encourage all of us to be open up in your friendships. Open up in your life groups. Life groups are such a great place to just say, look, man, I messed up. I've fallen. Or this person hurt me. My, my, my heart hurts because this person did that to me. It's such a great place, and I encourage you guys, open up in your relationships, be vulnerable, and trust that no matter what, God has you. Thank you. Come on, y'all give it up for these students. This isn't easy, man. I'm afraid Pastor John and I are out of a job. That was incredible. That was incredible. Guys, what you're looking at is the beginning of something great, I think. These students are answering a call that is on their life. And in this house, we believe that it's the next generation that's going to start a revival here in America, and around the world. Come on, clap if you agree with that. As I was listening to these messages, uh, I, I couldn't help but draw a common thread all the way through it. You know, what, what Macy said, anyone from anywhere who's done anything can come here and find a judgment-free zone where there's hope. Hope for, yes, for, for a, a better tomorrow. Help for what you're going through today and healing so you can move into the future that God has for you. See, we believe that with every fiber of our being. That's why we do everything that we do here at CT. Not only is this a place where anyone who's done anything can come and find hope, help, and healing in a judgment-free zone, but this is a place of trust. This is a place of honor. This is a place of family. That's why we wear the shirts that say family by choice, because this is what we choose. And if I could be honest and open and transparent with you guys, sometimes I get disappointed when I spend time with my family outside of this house because I expect them to love me like I'm loved here. I expect them to care for me the same way that I'm cared for when I come into this house where I'm greeted warmly and I get a hug and people are excited to hear what I have to say. How many of you get that experience every time you come? It's incredible, isn't it? But I can't help but be overwhelmed by the message that Jared just brought that when I leave this house, there's a drastic change from what I experience here to what I experience in my home with my family, my extended family. Brokenness just perpetuates hurt. It perpetuates mistrust. And it just destroys. But I need you to know that there's freedom from that destruction. There's freedom from that pain. There's freedom... When we come here, that's why so many of us have said, man, something just happens when we come into this place. And I want you to know that when you come in here, you're not only encountering a family who loves you, a family you can trust, but there's a father here 
who loves each and every one of you. And I would be uh, re- filled with regret if I didn't take the moment to tell you that the Father loves you. He loves you so much. He cares for you. Maybe you decided to come today because, you know, it's the end of the year. And maybe this year hasn't been incredible. Maybe it's been one struggle after another. And maybe you're, you've decided in your heart in the last ditch attempt to say, God, I'll give you a shot. But I want you to know that the Father wants to offer you a fresh start. He wants to give you a clean break today. I want you to know that if you're in here today and you said, I, I need a fresh start, I need a new beginning. You can have one that doesn't look like the, the, our, our, our things that we do every year. The word escapes me right now because I break them every time I make one, a New Year's resolution. This isn't a, re- a resolution. I made resolutions last year. I obviously have not fit and uh, kept up because I am not in shape, as you can see. I'm kind of uh, like the biscuits Pastor John talked about. But the, the, what, as I'm rambling, what I'm trying to get at is that when you have this fresh start in a relationship with the Father, it's not like something that you just have temporarily. This is an eternal fresh start. This is a new beginning. With every head bowed in this auditorium right now, this is just between you and your father. If you came in here today and you would say in your heart, I want a fresh start with God, would you just slip your hand up? I want to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would be so bold as to respond by raising your hand, what you're doing is you're just physically responding to something that's already happening in your heart. Now, I want to pray for you, but I I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Because I believe what the Bible says, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that He's risen from the grave, then we will be saved. And we will have the fresh start. And we will be a new creation. So if you would, all across the auditorium, but especially if you raised your hand today, would you pray this out loud? Loud enough to hear your own voice. Say, Father, I need a fresh start. Would you forgive me for what I've done this past year? Will you forgive me for what stands between you and I? God, I accept the free gift of new life in relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray.